I left off in the middle of a class, which is going to happen. Um, I just, it's just going to happen. Uh, it'll probably happen many times. Uh, if you guys were with me for the first six sessions, we had an hour and a half. No. Yeah, hour and a half. Uh, and now we have about 45 minutes. So it's hard. And I was behind then. Um, so it's going to be very difficult to kind of keep on top of things. So bear with me on that. Um, I want to start off just... Uh, briefly reviewing the stuff that we have covered so far. So, uh, and a reminder that if you want to catch up and take a look at um, former classes, you know, if you want to go back and watch videos of our of our past classes, they're all on YouTube. Just go to the Calvary Chapel uh, YouTube page, and you can find them all there. So, uh, just in review, we you know we, we're talking about theology. The goal of this class is to somewhat kind of come up with. Uh, a general understanding of what the Word of God reveals about God himself. Theology is the study of God, of his nature, of his character. Um, in the first class, uh, the first couple of classes really, we studied natural theology and dealt with the question of what God reveals to us about himself in nature. Uh, from there, we moved on to special revelation, talking about how it is that God reveals himself specifically through his word um, and the authority that his word has in our lives. Um, from there, we started to get into the actual attributes of God, defining him, describing him, explaining who he is, his characteristics, to the best of our ability, because there was this fundamental thing that we all needed to understand, which is that God, in a certain sense, is incomprehensible to humans. Uh, this is something that the scripture teaches uh, pretty plainly uh, to us. Um, and so we try to communicate who he is by analogy, by metaphor. Um, from there, we walked into the doctrine of the Trinity, and I spent two weeks uh, trying to explain uh, not just what the scriptures teach on the tri triune person of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, not just explaining what the scriptures uh, say about, about him, but also trying to briefly explain the controversies that had arisen in church history that gave rise to the doctrine of the Trinity. What I mean by that, and this is just to clarify, um, when the church first kind of burst forth, burst forth onto the earth, all they had was their Bible. They had these, this compilation of letters and, and the Gospels and the Book of Acts. And, and these are not a systematic theology. So they had to take what was written in these words, piece them together, and come up with a, a systematic understanding of who God is. And you really, it's one of the things that aids an understanding of who God is, is argumentation and opposition. And so it wasn't until people started opposing, that is, teaching, uh, opposing the doctrines of Scripture, that is, uh, offering false doctrines, that the church could kind of really take great care to, to be concrete in explaining what the Bible teaches on a certain number of things. So we talked about the Trinity, and then uh, last week we got into Christology, the nature of Jesus Christ, who he is. Um, and so I'm going to pick up on that, and I'm going to just briefly review what we talked about last week, and then I'm going to get into some new stuff. So looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse 10. It was fitting for him, speaking of Jesus, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. So this is, of course, an affirmation of Jesus' deity because it reminds us that all things are made for him and all things are made by him. So it was fitting for whom, um, uh, the one who for whom all things are and by whom all things are, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, let me explain. It's, taught, it's saying here how Jesus sanctifies and you, me, we are the ones being sanctified. And he says here, he, Jesus, is of one with us in some sense. And I'm going to, again, try to explain what that means. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. It quotes a couple of Old Testament scriptures, but skip over them and go down to verse 14. This is kind of the key verse. Inasmuch then as children, or as the children, have partaken of flesh and blood. And when he says the children, he means you and me, human beings. He himself, God, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. He himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. 
So the key part of this verse is he himself likewise shared in the same. That is, God himself shared in the very nature that you and I have. Okay, and so when we talk about Christology, that is at the core, that is at the heart of what it is we're talking about. In what sense is it that God became man? In what sense is it that God shared in, your, in, in our nature? In what sense is it that he became like us? That's the issue. And so last week, I talked about uh, the passages of Scripture which identified Jesus as a man, okay? Very important. It's something we often forget. Uh, we focus so much on his Godhead, on his Godhood, that we neglect the fact that he was a man, and we do so to our loss um, because it is a core fundamental truth that Jesus was a man. He was a human being like you and like me, right? Right? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter uh, 2, verse 5 says that uh, we have, there's one God and there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. And so that was kind of the focal verse. That's what I wanted to have us kind of meditate upon, have be the main uh, thing that we focus on last week. I also went through and talked about the fact that Jesus' characteristics are very man-esque, for lack of a better word, we talked about how he subjected himself to weakness, things that God proper, God in himself, doesn't have. He doesn't have weaknesses. Jesus is subjected to the kinds of weaknesses that we are. He's subjected to sickness. He was subjected to uh, weariness. That is, he grew tired and he would need to sleep. He was subjected to hunger. That is, he needed to eat. He was subjected ultimately to death. These are things that you and I partake in, but they're not things that God naturally partakes in. And so the important thing to pick up in all of this is, is that as Jesus partakes of these things, he is able to sympathize with you and me. He is able to empathize. He can understand who we are. Now, having gone through all of that last week, I started to talk about what theologians call Christological heresies. Um, that is, early in church history, people started coming up with various theories and ideas um, about what it meant for God to become man, about who Jesus was. They had all sorts of different ideas about, about the nature of Christ. And many of these were heretical. The Christians at the time heard them and said, these are wrong, these are heretical. And so it forced them to refine their understanding of the doctrine, okay? And so I'm, I'm just kind of briefly running through those. I've named three of them already. Uh, and so I'm just gonna briefly mention them. Docetism, Corinthianism, not Corinthianism, Corinthianism, C-E-R, and adoptionism. And all of these really isolate the nature of Jesus into one or other um, nature. In other words, for instance, docetism focuses on the nature of Christ as God. Um, docetists believe that flesh was evil. God could never take upon flesh. So God never became flesh. He never became a human. He never took on human weakness. They say that he came into the world as a phantom, he looked like he was flesh, he looked like he was human, but he did not have the weaknesses that we talked about, something which clearly does not square with scripture, which is contradictory to what the Bible teaches. So the church repudiated that, they called it heresy. Um, Corinthianism, uh, holding to a similar view, said that Jesus was just a man, but God possessed him, and that when Jesus died, God left him and left poor Jesus to hang there on the cross and die by himself. Um, adoptionism really just fundamentally denies Jesus' godhood, period. Says that Jesus was a man, he was a man like you and me, but he was better than us. And because of his incredible righteousness, God gave him favor and gave him an immense measure of the Holy Spirit so that he could be different from the rest of mankind. So those were the first three heresies. They arose through the first 300 years of church history. In all of them, Christians said, this doesn't square with what the Bible teaches. So they repudiated it, they condemned it, and people who taught these things were excommunicated. And when I say excommunicated, what I mean is, is they were, they were driven from the church. They were not allowed uh, communion. 
unless they were to repent, then they would be granted admission back to the church. So I left off with actually the bigger Christological heresies. These are the Christological heresies of the fourth and fifth centuries, which just so you know, if you go through and study church history, these were the main issue of discussion. And these ones, although I do think the heresies are all wrong, they're less clearly wrong than the originals, than the first. Um, these are, this really, I think you can kind of chalk up to the fact that at the end of the day, trying to explain who God is and what he's like is really hard. And I think a lot of these heresies, which were condemned in the 4th and 5th centuries, I think a lot of these heresies were put forth by often well-meaning people who were just trying to figure out what the Bible said and trying to make sense out of it. Um, so I'm going to describe them. And, and just to keep in mind, my purpose in describing these... Um, is one a bit of a history lesson. I do think it's valuable for us to know our roots, to know where we came from, to know why it is Christians believe the things they believe. Um, I do think there's a practical uh, purpose in all of this, which I hope I'll explain by the end of this class. Um, but it's also because, and I think this is very important, it is way easier to understand what you believe when you understand what you don't believe or when you understand what is error. It is way easier to understand what is right what is true when you understand what is false and what is wrong, okay? So I'm going to run through these. The first Christological heresy that popped up in the 3rd and 4th, or in the 4th and 5th centuries was called Apollinarianism. Apollinarianism. It was put forward by a guy named Apollinarius. That's where the name came from. And what he taught, it it's, sounds a little bit like adoptionism, but essentially there was a physical being, a physically created being who we call Jesus, um, and, but this being, unlike, or this person, unlike you and me, he was created without a mind or without a spirit. Mind and spirit did not inhabit his body. And God became his mind and spirit. So Apollinarius would say Jesus is God and Jesus is man, but he has two parts to him. He's got the physical part, the body, that's the man part. But then he has the God part, which is his mind and spirit. If you took his mind and if you took the God part away from Jesus, his body would just slump over, right? His, you know, I mean, he would just be a lifeless shell. It's very different from adoptionism, which taught that Jesus was a person, um, like a human being that the Holy Spirit came upon and empowered. And it's different from Corinthianism, which taught that Jesus was a person, a human being that God possessed like a demon might possess somebody. Um, Apollinarianism, Jesus is the body, he's the shell, God inhabits the mind. That was condemned as a heresy in the 4th and 5th century by the church. Um, the second one that I want to talk about, which arose after that, is called mono... Now, this is, these are big words. I don't know if you guys are note takers. I probably should get slides because it'd be easier for you guys to write this stuff down. I apologize for this. Um, uh, yeah, when I think about this word, I just think it's just kind of pointless even saying it. It's monophysitism, uh, or the church also referred to it as Eutychianism, uh, both of which are incredibly hard to spell. Um, sorry, I probably should put slides up at some point. Um, so monophysitism also, keep in mind, is trying to explain what does it mean for Jesus to be both God and man. What does it mean for Jesus to be both God and man? And so what monophysitists taught, and this is what a guy named Eutychius taught, which is why it's called Eutychianism. What monophysitists taught is that when Jesus was in Mary's womb, that essentially God took, well, maybe it's not in the womb, maybe it was when God made the decision to, uh, to, to impart uh, Jesus to Mary, like to, for her to, to give, to become pregnant. At that moment, the two natures, a God nature and a man nature, kind of joined together and they mixed up in a jumble. I mean, if you could, this sounds weird, but if you could imagine kind of taking Godness and pouring it in a cup and then taking manness and pouring it in a cup and then closing the cup up and then shaking it, right? Kind of shaking it. Um, that is essentially what monophysitists taught. They taught that what came out of this cup when you poured it out was a third nature altogether, was something totally different from God or man. In, in essence, so if I could kind of boil this down, they would say Jesus 
is something totally different from God and totally different from man. And you can appreciate that a lot of Christians hearing this uh, got pretty upset because if you say he's of a third nature, if he's a third kind of thing, then that doesn't mean he's, a, he's both God and man. That means he's neither God nor man, um, which is really troubling. So Eutychius was counted as a heretic and excommunicated. Uh, however, there were a bunch of people who liked what Eutychius taught, but they just had a problem with that whole third nature thing. They, they thought that, you know, they had the problem that I just described. They said, this makes him neither God nor man, so why don't we do something a little different? They said, why don't we take the two natures, God and man, we marry them together, we marry them together, and we, again, the, the blender analogy, which I would imagine if there was an actual monophysitist here or an actual, well, meophysitist, which is what I'm about to describe, I would imagine they'd have problems with my analogies. Um, just, that's because analogies always fall short, just an FYI. But if you can go back to our blender analogy, you pour the two natures in, you shake it up again, and then you pour something out. And here, this group says, but what comes out of the cup is a mixture of God and man, not a whole new nature. It's a mixture of God and man. So he's still both God and he's still man, but he's a mixture of God and man. Okay? Weird. That's called Mia physitism. Mia physitism. Monophysitism isn't widely held anymore. Mia physitism is actually believed um, in kind of Egypt. It's a pretty common view in, in uh, North Western Af or sorry, Northeastern Africa, sorry. Uh, pretty common view in Northeastern Africa, Mia physitism. Uh, the Oriental Orthodox Church holds to a Mia physitist view. So you can find Mia physitists. And people, you know, the church at the time, they condemned Mia physitism. They said, this is not good. But they did say, but it's better than all the rest of these things. So it's wrong. It's a heresy, but it's kind of like a better heresy than other heresies, if, if that makes sense. Um, there was a, another one, and this will be the last of the heretical ones that I will mention. Um, and this is the one that actually gave rise to the real fighting and the real debate. It was put forward by a guy named Nestorius, and it was called Nestorianism. And what Nestorius taught is that within the person, within the body of Jesus, inside of him, he had two distinct persons inside of him. He had God the Son and he had the man Jesus. And these two were somehow connected. Again, not really explained. It, how do you explain things like this? We're trying to describe the mysteries of God. But he says you have two persons in Jesus, which is very confusing when you think of the Trinity, right? I mean, the Trinity is one God, three persons. I think he was actually influenced by Trinitarian doctrine. He thought, well, if you can have one God who's three persons, why can't you have one being that's, or one human that's two persons? Um, so you have these two persons in the one human, Jesus, God the Son and Jesus Christ. Um, and he began to teach something that actually annoyed Christians in the fourth century, uh, and it might actually unsettle some of you. He began teaching against the use of a term. The word is theotokos. It was a Greek word, theotokos, and it means God bearer. And it was a term that Christians had used in the, in the I mean, pretty far back, second century, third century, to describe Mary. That is, that when Mary conceived Christ, that she was called the Theotokos. If you were to ever go into an Eastern Orthodox church, uh, they would uh, definitely use that term, um, the Theotokos, the God-bearer. And the doctrine behind it is, and what they're trying to say when they refer to Mary as Theotokos, as God-bearer, is that Jesus is so God that even when he was an infant in her womb, he was God. So that she literally... Uh, conceived God in her womb. She is the God bearer. For those nine months, she bore God in her womb. Now, doctrinally, I think that's fine. However, and this is something we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about in our systematic theology. Uh, however, it did give rise to what we as Protestants would definitely identify as potential heresies uh, because this uh, ha helped to kind of fuel a lot of the 
the Mary veneration and a lot of the doctrines, the weird doctrines that have arisen around Mary in the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, just to kind of get you thinking down that way, basically people said, if Jesus is sinless and he doesn't, and I mentioned this last week, he doesn't have Adam's sin nature, they thought, then whatever was carrying him at that time must also have been sinless or else it would have tainted him. Does that make sense? And so this, by the way, they didn't necessarily believe this back then. It just gave rise to that kind of thinking and people started to think of Mary's womb as being spotless. And if her womb is spotless, then maybe she is. And this gave rise to um, kind of Mary, Marian perfectionism and things like that. Something which is wrong, is false doctrine, but that's where it came from. But the original term Theotokos was not, it didn't necessarily carry with it all that. It just was this fundamental thing that Mary in her womb bore Jesus and Jesus was God even in her womb. Like we want, they, in essence, they're repudiating um, adoptionism and repudiating Corinthianism and maybe even Apollinarianism. They're trying to say, look, Jesus has always been God. There was never a time when he wasn't God. That's essentially the point of calling Mary Theotokos. Um, so uh, Nestorius and Nestorianism were condemned as heresies. Uh, and people who held to these views were excommunicated from the church. Uh, and, and what all of this did is it gave rise to bishops and pastors getting together to try to hammer out what is proper doctrine on these matters. Now, if you were to go back and listen to my first sessions, I did a section on the Trinity, as I mentioned a moment ago, and I talked about the Nicene Council or the Council of Nicaea. And at the Council of Nicaea, you had a similar issue. All right. You had certain people in the church who were saying that Jesus was not God, but was a created being and that God was not triune, that he was one person and one God. And so the Christians got together at Nicaea in 325 AD and they started arguing with each other. They said, hey, we got to define this and we got to make sure everybody knows exactly what we as Christians believe. And that's what gave us the Nicene Creed, which I read to you guys um, back then. Well, the Christians did this again in the year 451 AD, 451, at the Council of Chalcedon, at the Council of Chalcedon. They got together to repudiate monophysitism and to repudiate Nestorianism to try to say, who is Jesus exactly, okay? And what came from this are a couple of doctrines that are and have been foundational for every Christian faith ever since, with one exception, that being the Oriental Orthodox Church that I mentioned. Everybody else, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholics, all Protestant denominations, Evangelicalism, Southern Baptist, Calvary Chapel, everybody else has held to what came out of Chalcedon. And what came out of Chalcedon is called the definition of Chalcedon. That is the definition of the nature of Jesus as God and man. And it establishes a, a phrase... This is one hope which you might put up there, uh, the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union comes out of this. And I'm going to explain what that is here in a second. But what I'm going to do first is I'm going to read for you the definition of Chalcedon. Um, so not checking my text. I'm, I got it online. <laughs> uh, okay, so following then the Holy Fathers. And it's always very important on these, in these creeds. They want to make sure everybody understands that what they're teaching goes all the way back to the earliest Christian teachers. And this is true. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I started, I don't know how many of you guys know this, but I started to do a, bod, a podcast on the history of Christian theology with uh, two of my friends, um, both brilliant guys. My friend Chad, uh, he's actually working on his PhD in theology at St. Louis University right now, uh, has his master's uh, from an Ivy League school, which can be bad, but he, Chad's a good one. <laughs> um, uh, but we got together and we basically held discussions talking about the history of theology and read the ancient texts. And we were planning on going, you know, through all of it from the beginning all the way to now, um, which would take forever. We got about 58 episodes up. So they're on there. If you ever want to go listen to them called the history of Christian theology, but um, we stopped and I think we stopped because Chad got a girlfriend. 
Um, now fiance, <laughs> just got engaged just a few days ago. Uh, that's why I think we stopped because he just basically couldn't, he was too busy. And it was sad because I'm a non-confrontational guy. Chad's a really non-confrontational guy. So we would still meet and we would still record our podcasts, but they kept not going up. They kept not being put online. And I was like, hmm, because I don't know how to do that. And I really don't have the time to do it. So I would ask him, I'd say, hey, why didn't that go up yet? And he'd always go, get into it. I'm getting to it. And after five months of recording <laughs> and nine episodes, because we took a lot of weeks off, um, after five months of recording and nine, nine episodes, I finally said, Chad, are we going to ever put these up? And he goes, I don't know. And I said, we just probably need to stop. So I'm hoping we can pick that back up at some point. Um, I'm going to try to get back to it this summer when time is a little more available. But um, nonetheless, you can get a little bit of what we're talking of, of what the fathers believed if you want to download some of those early episodes. Anyway, following then the Holy Fathers, we unite, always very important to the early church or to this, to the church in the fourth century or fifth century. We unite, we're together. Like we don't disagree on this. We unite in teaching all men to confess the one and only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The self-same one is perfect, both in deity and in humanness. This self-same one is also actually God and actually man. And here is the fundamental definition of Chalcedon, that Jesus is fully God, fully man, actually God, actually man, not half God, half man, not some new kind of thing, He's 100% God, 100% man. He goes on and says, um, uh, he is of the, oh, sorry, with a rational soul, meaning a human soul and a body. That's to repudiate the Apollinarians. He has a soul. He has a mind. Just that's a human one. He is of the same reality as God, as far as his deity is concerned, and of the same reality as ourselves, as far as his humanness is concerned. Thus, like us in all respects, with one exception. What's the one exception? Sin. He said, they say right here, sin accepted. That's a very important thing. Jesus is just like us naturally, with one exception, sin. He has all the same frailty. He has all of the same kinds of frustrations. He has all of the same kind of natural responses, just like you and me. The only difference in his humanness is that we sin and he does not. However, he is also just like the Father. Just, he is God in every way in regards his deity. Now, uh, in these last days for us, and behalf of, uh, on behalf of our sal salvation, this self-same one was born of Mary the Virgin, who is God-bearer in respect of his humanness. So again, the Theotokos, that phrase, and it's just trying to point out that he was always God, even in her womb. Um, we also teach that we apprehend, that is, or comprehend, or understand this one and only Christ, Son, our Lord, the only begotten. We understand him in two natures, okay, which, I, which they've already said, God and man, two distinct natures. And we do this without confusing the two natures. So here he's, they're denying monophysitism and they're denying meophysitism. We don't confuse the two natures. There's two distinct natures, one person. By the way, in saying there's one person, they reject Nestorianism. It's not two people, it's one person. Uh, we do this without confusing the two natures, without transmuting one nature into the other, without dividing them into separate categories, without contrasting them according to area or function. The distinctiveness of each nature is not nullified by the union. Okay, the fact that in this person of Jesus, the, the, the fullness of God and the fullness of man are unified, it is not, that fact is not nullified. It is not done away with by their union. Instead, the properties of each nature are conserved and both natures concur in one person and in one, and here's the word that I asked Hope to put up there. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't actually ask her to put this up there. Hypostasis, one reality or one person. They are not divided or cut into two persons, that's the rejection of Nestorianism, but are together the one and only and only begotten word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus have the prophets of old testified, thus the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us, and thus the Nicene Creed has handed down to us. So the definition of Chalcedon, which has been accepted by all 
churches, all of them, every single Christian church, since the definition of Chalcedon in 451, with that one exception of the Oriental Orthodox, um, is that there is one person, Jesus, with two distinct natures, God and man, and that these two distinct natures are unified in what is called the hypostatic union. Okay, the hypostatic union. And hypostatic is just the Greek word for person. And so when we talk about the hypostatic union, we're talking about the union of the two natures in one person, Jesus. Uh, and to, to kind of compare that or describe that in light of uh, Trinitarian doctrine, uh, good, there we go. Uh, to compare that, uh, thanks so much, Hope, uh, with Trinitarian doctrine, if you guys recall, I pointed out that according to Trinitarian doctrine, we serve one God, one God, not many gods, not three gods. We serve one God who is three persons. And it's all based off of the same Greek word, three hypostasis, three persons. Jesus is one person, one hypostasis, two natures. God is one God, one essence, three hypostases, three persons. That's the nature of the Godhead as revealed in scripture. By the way, this definition gives, has, gives rise to lots of questions. And a person coming out of the Council of Chalcedon might be able to answer some of those, but for a lot of them, like with the Trinity, he says, it's a mystery. The, like we're just taking what the Bible says and we're trying to be consistent across the board with what scripture teaches. It is a mystery. We can't explain exactly what's going on or why it is the way that it was written. We're just telling you what God has revealed. And everybody who believed contrary, essentially were excommunicated. And here I just wanna mention, um, that in the first six centuries of church history, prior to what would be called the Great Schism of 1054, 1054 is the first time that you have a massive split in the church. In 1054, you have the, the, what would later become kind of known as the Roman Catholic Church splits from the Eastern Orthodox Church, and they have different seats of power and fundamentally are broken in communion from that point forward. That's the first major split in the church. That's not to say that you don't have little sects that kind of break off, but the sects that have broken off, that break off prior to the year 1054 fizzle out. None of them, for the most part, that I'm aware of, have continued on down to today. You had though the, the, a unified church that split in 1054, and then the second major split will happen, of course, in the 16th century, in 15, seven, beginning in 1517, when Martin Luther will post the 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, and will thus begin the Protestant Reformation, where then you have a massive splitting, right? Um, uh, a, a massive splitting of the church. But... Ev, you know, everybody, Protestants as well as Catholics and as well as um, Eastern Orthodox, had always acknowledged that those first few councils that popped up were legitimate and were useful in kind of establishing doctrine. Now, a Protestant would say about these councils that they're not inspired by God. They're not God's word. They're not on par with the Bible. Okay, that's what I would say. Any Protestant would say that. Council of Nicaea is good. It's helpful. Council of Chalcedon is good. It's helpful. They are not the word of God. Okay, I think they're correct in what they in what they handed down to us. They're not the word of God, and if it just so happens that they're wrong, I'm okay with that. Um, to an Eastern Orthodox and a Roman Catholic person, they can't say that. Uh, to them, it is inspired by God in the same way the Bible is. Uh, so for them, the first seven ecumenical councils is what they're called are God's word, and of those seven. Two of them deal with the Trinity, which is the Council of Nicaea and the Council of, of uh, Constantinople. And the uh, four of them deal with uh, this definition of Jesus as God and man. Uh, the other one actually deals with icons, which we're probably not going to talk about. Um, so that's a history lesson. There's the definition that's what Christians have kind of always believed. If you were to talk to some kind of a scholar who was trying to just, I mean, this is something a lot of people don't know, but let's say you were talking to some atheist or secular scholar who is trying to give some kind of a definition to what it means to be a Christian. And mind you, I'm not, I'm not agreeing with this atheist or secular scholar. I think what matters is new life, being born again, having Christ come into your life and, and, and give you new birth. That's what matters. Secular scholars aren't gonna care about that. But it's helpful to note that if they're talking about Christians, in their mind, what is defined as a Christian 
is anybody who believes essentially these two things, the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the hypostatic union, because those are the two things that are consistent with everybody, with all of us, Protestantism, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy. So some kind of a secular scholar is going to look to these two things. And if somebody doesn't believe one of these two things, then even a secular scholar would say they're a fringe group or they're a, uh, a non-Christian break off. Like for instance, Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses and, or Mormons, they don't believe those first two um, or those two doctrines. And so even a scholar, like even a secularist would say, oh yeah, they're, uh, they're a Christian fringe group. They don't properly qualify as, as Christian. So that's kind of the terminology. It's not really necessarily all that important, but um, having said that, turn with me to the book of Philippians, because I want us to consider now, like the question of, so what? Okay, great. Thank you for telling me this. What's the significance of it? Philippians chapter two Look here in verse three. Actually, let's start in verse five, actually. Paul writing here says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So he actually stops here and he, he, he wants to give pause. And he says, let's emulate Jesus. Keeping in mind what? Keeping in mind this, verse six. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Very unfortunate translation. Um, by the way, and I can't recall if this is the case, maybe one of you guys can help me. Did I, did I go through this passage when we went over the Trinity? Does anybody remember? I didn't? Okay, good. This is all new. Good. Because I was trying to think of whether or not I should uh, speed through it. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now I want to pause here. And I'm going to do something that I usually tell people not to do. Um, I usually tell people that if there's somebody sitting up on a stage and he tells you something means something in the Greek and it goes against what's in the Bible, don't trust him. Don't trust him because, because here's the thing, always, 100% of the time, I'm pretty sure, maybe a little less than that, but almost 100% of the time, if not 100% of the time, the guys who translated your Bible know way more about Greek than your pastor. Does that make sense? Like way more. Now that doesn't mean they're right. Translators can be wrong and, and a pastor who knows way less about Greek could be right for sure. But, but you have to understand, most of us just don't quite understand how language works. All right. And we don't understand why translators make the choices that they make. So I started this by saying, I'm going to violate my rule because I'm going to tell you that here the translators got it wrong. And what I would normally tell you if you were to walk out, of, like if you, if, if you were to walk out of this study and you were to come to me somewhere else and say, the guy teaching on Wednesday night said, don't trust what the translator said here. I would say, don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And I can tell you right now that although, although I, I, I'm, I'm pretty decent with Greek and I've taught Greek, I taught Greek for four years, um, I am, there is not a single person who contributed to translating the Bible who I can come close to comparing with in their understanding of Greek, right? I mean, there's none of them, not even close. Translators, that's their job. They know it. I forget it, right? That's probably the best way to characterize my relationship with Greek. Um, I feel like I'm safe in saying this though, because if you don't use a New King James Bible, and pretty much if you use any Bible but the New King James or Old King James, it will read differently than here. <laughs> so I feel like I can say, but look, every other translator ever translated it the way I'm going to tell you to translate it. <laughs> so I at least have that kind of justification. The King James guys got it wrong. And by the way, the New King James guys got it wrong because the Old King James guys got it wrong. You know, they're just trying to be faithful to the Old King James as much as possible. So let me explain to you what this should say. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. Now that first word form is okay. It just is a little misleading for our sakes because we don't use the word form the way that the Greeks used it, right? Um, 
if you were to read Greek philosophy, you don't even have to read Greek, you would see the word form pop up often. And unlike us, where when we talk about the form of something, we often are talking about like the shape of it or kind of, uh, I don't know, something that we could use to kind of replicate, you know, to form something. Um, the Greeks, when they used the word form, they thought of it as the nature or essence of a thing, okay? So you've ever heard anybody talk about Plato's forms, this is what they're talking about. Plato's forms are the natures and essence of things in the world around us. So here, when Paul says that, that Jesus was in the form of God, what he means is Jesus was God, essentially. That God, Jesus was of the essence of God, is of the essence of God. Who being in the essence of God, and here's where the translation really breaks down, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. What that should say, is did not consider his equality with God something to be, most translations say, grasped or held on to. And what it means is, is that Jesus, who was God, the creator of the universe, who existed from eternity past, who spoke the world into existence, he did not consider his prerogative and his position as God as something to be held on to. Okay? Okay? But instead, verse 7, he made himself of no reputation. Many of your translations will say he emptied himself. That is, in some sense, and this I cannot explain, he essentially, and it's not that he gave up, please don't misunderstand me with this, it's not that he gave up his godhood. He didn't stop being God at any moment, ever. But he took his prerogatives as God, and in some sense, he restrained from using them, right? That is, he limited himself. I mentioned this last week, God is all-knowing. And what that means is all truth is present to his mind at all times. But when Jesus walked in this world, he couldn't function in that way. He had to function with a human mind. That is a human mind that takes things linearly, that takes things as they come. So he limited himself in a way. Now, he's still God and he could have accessed it at any time. He could at any moment call it up if you wanted, but he, he limited himself on purpose. He purposefully limited himself, took on no reputation, continuing in verse seven, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. And guys, this is the key to what Paul's getting at. Because look at, I mean, think about how verse five started again. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, think like Jesus thought. He humbled himself and became obedient. Think about that. The creator of the universe, the one who speaks all things into existence, the one who can speak and all things will stop existing, he became obedient to things, right? What kinds of things? Well, he became obedient to hunger and he became obedient to weariness and he became obedient to his parents and he became obedient to death so that when death came at his door, he submitted, right? He submitted. He became obedient, continuing in verse 8, to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on the earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself, he emptied himself, and you need to let this mind be in you. And look back to verse three. This is the context. I almost started at verse three, but I wanted to come back to it because what is it he's trying to teach? He says in verse three, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. It's an amazing thing when you think about it that it is human nature to want power. It is human nature to want authority. It is human nature to want honor. And if we have any of those things stripped of us, we are offended. And we naturally, I mean, some people are pretty good at like resisting that, but it is a natural offense and it goes down to the deepest part of who we are. We don't like to be dishonored and we don't like to be impinged upon. If somebody makes, a, if somebody offends me, I want them to know just how strong I am. I want them to know just what I can do in retaliation. I want them to be afraid of me. 
And the moments when people have dishonored me like that, they stick with me, right? I still remember being in high school playing baseball and I was sitting down getting ready to warm up and this guy walks by, a guy on a, one of the varsity guys, I was a JV guy, and he walks over and he spits on me. And I just remember thinking, what? And at the time I didn't do anything because... I mean, it wasn't that he had more friends than me, but he had ample friends and a tussle there on the field would not be good. But in my mind, I kept thinking, don't you know what I could do to you? Don't you, like, he's this tall, stringy, sorry for all of you who are tall and stringy. <laughs> the big thing for me was that I wanted him to acknowledge that I was better than him, right? And that him dishonoring me was foolishness. Because I wanted to claim what I thought was rightfully mine, which is my place of honor and my place of authority. Like, that's what I thought I should have. Another, I remember, this is not a fight type of thing. This was when I was in college once. Uh, I was in a class. It was an honors class, and I was not in the honors program at Boise State. I was in the class because I was a philosophy major, and my professor liked me. And so he asked me if I would take this class for him, and he would give me uh, kind of a pass I, so I could be in it. And uh, we got in a discussion, an argument. And um, I thought of myself as being very good at arguing. Um, I was a philosophy major, and philosophy majors, just so you know, are definitely the most arrogant group at, in a college. Sorry if you're philosophy majors, but if you're a philosophy major, you know this, right? Um, <laughs> We were all very proud of who we were. We were very proud that, that we studied philosophy and we were gonna get nothing for it. We had no career path. We were studying because we cared about truth. And we were very proud of the fact that we had the highest GPA in the college. And we were very proud of the fact that we lived in a world of people selling their souls and we were not. Which I don't actually think that, but that's kind of the, you know, and I was fairly arrogant. I am fairly arrogant. I mean, I, I try to fight it, I hope, but I, I you know, it's there for sure. And I got in this argument with this girl who frankly, just not as good as I am at arguing. Um, and she, uh, we were arguing about a silly thing. We were arguing about uh, the principle of mad. Are you familiar with the principle of mad mutually assured destruction? Uh, the principle that essentially, even today in theory, kind of governs the whole idea behind our nuclear arsenals. The idea is, is that we're not, we have them, but we're not going to use them because if we use them, well, that's just the end of the world, right? Uh, during the Cold War, the Russians had enough to destroy us and we had enough to destroy them and we were not going to use it because the moment, I mean, if the Russians didn't have it, I would be happy, not me, but I'm saying the idea is we would have pushed the button, but they did have them. So pushing the button means destroying ourselves, right? So we're sitting there in this class and this girl says, I don't even remember the context, but just keep in mind, this is 20 years ago, right? I remember everything from the moment the argument starts. <laughs> and she says, she says, well, mad didn't work. And I go, excuse me? <laughs> she goes, it didn't work. And I go, that's preposterous. Of course it worked. She goes, what do you mean? And I go, what do you mean? <laughs> We're still here. To which she starts to go, it had a negative effect on the economy and blah, negative effect on blah, 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 and running down all these things that it was bad in. To which what I wanted to say was, oh, you're trying to say it had negative effects. Got it. I believe that. I'm sure it did. My, but I'm not arguing about whether it had negative effects. I'm arguing about whether it was effective in us not destroying each other, which it seems patently that it was. That's what I was going to say. But after she gave her list of reasons, she then stopped and said to me, you should probably stop, I'm on the debate team. <laughs> At which point I was like, you know, I was kind of like, all right, let's, and I was just about to respond and Dr. Brenton, my professor, who is my bosom friend? <laughs> Who knows me? He does. I literally dedicated his grandchildren on this stage. He knows that this would drive me crazy. I've never asked him about it. But he turned, he said, Tom, why don't we stop? We don't have time for this. We've got to move on. And I just remember sitting there thinking, seriously? You're not going to let me make my point? 
And all I could think about for the next 20 years <laughs> is that every person sitting in that room thought she got the best of me because she was on the debate team. Now, my point is, is that we cannot handle our honor being impinged. We can't handle it. Like, it's, it messes with us, and we don't like it in any context. We don't like it at work. We don't like it in our families. We don't like it in public. We don't like it when we're driving. And it, it stirs up in us this desire to retaliate, to lash out, to get even, to get back at everyone. Um, and Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who was the creator of the universe, and think of what happened to him as he submitted to every single thing you could imagine. I imagine his parents spanked him. I've heard people say, probably not, he was perfect. Yes, he was perfect, but they weren't. What do you do when your parent makes a mistake and you get punished for it? That happens. I can see it happening to Jesus. And how do you submit to that? Mom, let us not forget where that hand came from. <laughs> right? <laughs> He had to submit at every single step along the way. And of course, we don't see all of it, but we see it very poignantly as he is carrying that cross in the gospels and as people are spitting on him and as people are mocking him and as he hangs on that cross and they say, if you really are the son of God, then come down off that thing. And he could at any moment snap his fingers and they would all cease to exist. And who wouldn't want to do that? Who wouldn't want to, at least for fun, just say, just one of you. I'm going to show you what happens. <laughs> just one. Because we want people to fear us and we want people to respect our station. And Jesus submitted at every single point. He became obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. And why does this matter? It matters for a million different reasons. And this comes to the core of our Christology. This is at the core of why it is important to understand that God became man? It is, first of all, because of what I just said, he is our example. At the end of the day, whatever we are as Christians is only to be an emulation of him. And so who am I supposed to be? I am supposed to be like Jesus. And what did he do? He did, he did the unthinkable in becoming man. But two, and this comes back to 2 Timothy chapter, or sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, right? There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Also, we see it in the gospel of John chapter 1, verse 18, where John says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son has declared him. There are two more things that we get from, the, from our Christology, from the incarnation of God as man. Actually, there's way more, but I'm going to get into that down the road. Um, but two more things I want to talk about right now. And that is what I asserted a little bit ago. We don't understand God. We can't understand God. What does it mean for somebody to be infinite? Do you remember as a kid when your mom told, I don't know if your mom told you that. She told me that. I said, you know, I, I asked her the question of where everybody came from. And like, where did I come from? You came from me. Where did you come from? I came from your grandmother. Where did grandma come from? From granny, right? I mean, I'm going through this whole thing. I'm learning about age and all that kind of stuff. And I asked her, eventually she just gets to God. Everything came from God. And I go, where did God come from? And she said, he came from nowhere. <laughs> Which seems like a child. I mean, like as a kid, I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. And I said, well, when did he start? And she said, he's always been here. Makes no sense. That makes no sense. It makes so little sense that, uh, have any of you guys, you guys have all heard of Richard Dawkins, I assume, the famous atheist. He wrote a book called The God Delusion in which he presents what he thinks is the class, the ultimate argument against God's existence. And don't get me wrong, there are good arguments out there. He doesn't present any of them. Um, <laughs> but at one point in his book, he, he takes an argument I talked about at the start of this class, not like today, but when I, in, during the first sessions, um, uh, the cosmological argument, this idea that, God, that there has to be a first cause, uh, that, that, that if you trace this idea of cause and effect and all of the universe back, there must have been some beginning point. He says, where did God come from? which misses the whole point of the argument and all of that kind of stuff. But my point is, is that it doesn't matter if you're a kid, it doesn't matter if you're a brilliant scientist, which he is a brilliant scientist. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to say God is infinite. It doesn't make sense to say he knows everything. There are all sorts of things we talk about about God that we just don't understand. But you know what we do understand? We understand human beings. 
We understand human beings, and because I understand human beings, I understand Jesus. I know what Jesus would have said in certain scenarios because he said things in certain scenarios. I understand how he would treat people because I watch him treating people certain ways. I understand Jesus, and because I understand Jesus, I understand God because Jesus is God. But then there's this other thing, and this might seem weird. It might even seem a little irreverent, but it's not. God also understands us, which he couldn't do if he did not become man. Oh, he could know everything about us. He could know everything that we think, but he couldn't have experienced it. He couldn't have understood what it was like to feel fear. He couldn't have understood what it was like to feel pain. He couldn't have understood what it was like to feel weakness. He couldn't have understood our plight. And so this is the most amazing thing is that in this definition of Chalcedon, where we get this, this fact of God becoming man, of the nature of God and the nature of man unified in one person, this hypostatic union. In this, we have heaven and earth meeting and heaven and earth can understand each other. I can understand God, not perfectly, but I can understand him and he can understand me. And this is what creates and opens the door for redemption. So there's a lot more to what our Christology gets us, but this is the core, it's the basic.